Okay, so thank you for giving me this opportunity here to talk about Glacier Myth. So I will introduce, uh, oh, this is the first slide. Uh, I will introduce Glacier Myth and show some of our results. So Glacier Myth stands for the Glacier Model Intercomparison Project, uh, which has been co-led by Ben Masayan and myself during the last four years with our uh, larger Glacier Myth team. Um, we target all glaciers in the world outside the ice sheets. So that's about 200,000 glaciers covering an area of about 700 square, 1,000 square kilometers, which corresponds to the size of Texas or the size of Great Britain and Spain together. The sea level equivalent is about 40 centimeters, but although they only these glaciers contain about 1% of the globalized volume, there are currently significant contributors to sea level rise. Here's a recent global uh, glacier mass loss study. And uh, so these glaciers uh, contribute about a fourth to a third of the observed global sea level rise during the last one or two decades. Um, the ice sheet community has done model intercomparisons for decades, but not so the glacier community. And that's maybe because until very recently, only very few groups in the world have developed models to project all glaciers in the world. So between 2000 and 2012, there were only two global scale projections in the literature. This changed then with AR5, the uh, IPC report in 2013. With that coming up, a few new models were developed, uh, but in total, it's only like seven models over a period of about two decades. And none of these efforts have, they, or have been coordinated with other groups. So what we saw, we saw a need for a more coordinated effort. And that's how Glacier MIP was started about four years ago. So Glacier MIP <coughs> is a targeted, experiment, uh, targeted activity of the Climate and Cryosphere Project, uh, which is part of the World Climate Research Program. And the goals are to provide a framework for coordinated intercomparison of global scale mass change models and to foster improvement of these models and re reduce the uncertainties in projections. So our first effort was to gather data from the literature and compare these uh, projections systematically. And this first round included all the six existing models since 2010. So we had an open call for data and in total more than 200 model runs were uh, submitted. They were forced by, up, um, by a total of 25 GCMs and four emission scenarios. And we looked at the period 2015 to 2100 and compared the area and volume evolution of these models. And here some results on the global scale. We here are three emission scenarios. What you see is the volume evolution for these three emission scenarios. And by the end of the century, uh, the volume reduction on a global scale for the low emission scenario is about 18% um, and uh, up to for their higher emission scenario about 36%. So at the end of the century, there's still a lot of ice left, but substantial area and volume reductions. The blue numbers are the sea level rise by the end of the century uh, since 2015, and that varies between about nine centimeters to 20 centimeters from the low to the high emission scenario. Um, looking at this a little bit on a uh, regionally differentiated scale, what you see here is for uh, 19 glacierized regions and for uh, global, uh, for three emission scenarios, the mass loss by the end of the century relative to 2015. And each dot is the multi-GCM mean of one of these six uh, GCMs. And what you see here is there's huge var variations by region. So regions, for instance, Central Europe are, are projected to lose almost all their mass by the end of the century. And especially the regions where there's little ice, like Central Europe, Caucasus, Scandinavia, North Asia, are huge reductions in, in volume and mass are projected or in the order of 80, 90 or more percent. Whereas the regions where there's relatively little, ice, uh, a lot of ice, like Alaska, Russian Arctic, uh, so all the Arctic regions, uh, the relative uh, reductions in mass are less in the order of 10, 12, 30, uh, 20, 30 to 40%. But when it comes to sea level rise, their picture is different. Um, these regions with very little ice in the lower part of this graph, uh, the sea level contribution is negligible, even though they lose essentially all, all of their ice or most of their ice. 
Whereas the regions in the Arctic with a lot of ice, those are the large sea level contributors. But what we see exactly those regions that are important for sea level rise, you see huge differences between the glacial models. So that's is of course a concern because that's where their highest uncertainty is obviously in these regions that matter. And, but this in the first intercomparison is, was a little bit difficult because the, uh, the experiments were not standardized. So the different groups, it was not coordinated. They used different glacial inventory versions, different initial volumes, different climate models. So it was a little bit difficult to compare. So this led then to the next phase of glacial MIP, um, so the phase two, where uh, we made an open call again, um, but now all the model to, uh, modeling groups had to adhere to standardized simulations and boundary conditions. So we used the same glacial boundaries, the uh, initial volumes were prescribed, uh, the same set of GCMs, so this led to about, um, so almost 280 simulations uh, were submitted from now 11 glacier models. And that included four of the previous models and seven new ones. And that was very exciting because it was also very new types of models were included. There was one earth system model. Um, some of the glacier models included a flow model. There were energy balance approaches. So we had a wider range of model approaches. In total, uh, we, we had 10 GCMs that we, everybody wanted to, we wanted everybody to use in four emission scenarios. So on a global scale, the results are similar to what we had before, but they're a little bit lower than our previous estimates. Um, here, 17 to 38 percent volume loss by the end of the century, and the sea level equivalent cumulative is um, 7.5 to 16.5 centimeters. And that's why it's a little lower, but well within the uncertainties of our previous estimates, uh, because two of the additional models uh, had lower sensitivities, and that was especially like the Earth's system model. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the volume evolution um, for all the regions, trend in volume evolution for uh, the two uh, GCMs with uncertainty, and oh, but also for the other uh, two. Uh, uh, no, I, um, we see it for four RCPs for four emission scenarios, but only the uh, low and high emission scenarios. The uncertainties are shown because otherwise the figure becomes unreadable. And the results are very similar. So what we've saw before: regions with a lot of ice have uh, reductions in volume of 10, 20, 30 percent, whereas the regions <coughs> Uh, with very little eyes are projected in a number of simulations to essentially lose all their mass. Um, another way to look at these uh, projections is to look at specific mass changes. Specific means it's the mass change per unit area um, uh, here in kilogram per square meter per year. So 2000 means um, that's a an average thinning over the entire region of two meters in water equivalent, just to give an idea what that means. So it's essentially the average thinning rates for every year. And it's not cumulative, it's, it's a rate. And what we see, <coughs> um, what we see is huge changes between the regions, but also large changes between the two RCPs. For RCP 2.8, um, the, uh, it doesn't really change very much over the course of the century. And in some regions, like in Central Europe and low latitudes of Caucasus, the mass changes are actually approaching zero. And that is the warming is not sufficient for, um, or is so, uh, yeah, it's uh, the glaciers retreat um, to higher elevations and that's how they can reach a new equilibrium and, and survive. Whereas for the high emission scenario, the warming is so intense that the glaciers, this can, the retreat cannot compensate for this increased warming. So the average thinning rates by year, every year that becomes larger and larger. And there's really some extreme examples here in Russian Arctic, especially in the Arctic, the average thinning rates here in water equivalent, they, by the end of the century, there are like three, four, five, six, seven meters per year. And it's in all regions for the RPC 8.5, the average staining rates are just increasing over, over um, the course of the century.
Another way to look at it is looking at it in um, sea level uh, uh, sea level equivalent rates. Um, and you see the same picture, of course, as the basis uh, for RCP 2.6. There is a, um, the sea level rates decrease, and that is because, I mean, some of the glaciers disappear, but also because glaciers reach or approach a new equilibrium. So less water is coming from these glaciers. Whereas for RCP 8.5, there's a steady increase in the sea level contribution. And what I really want to emphasize here, look at the rates. Uh, the sea level contribution by the end of the century is here in the order between 2 and 3.5 millimeters per year. And that's the rate we have right now. So the current sea level rate raise is about 3, 3.5 millimeters per year. By the end of the century, what we um, project here is uh, exactly what we have now from all the components. So there are really a sort of substantial contributor also in the future. Now I want to do a comparison here with the ice sheets. This is a figure from the RCP, um, for the IPC special report on the oceans and the cryosphere. So by the end of the century, about 20 centimeters of mass loss. Um, when you look at the ice sheets, so, oops, sorry. Um, the glaciers by the end of the century, it's not only now that they are contributing a lot, but by the end of the century, they're projected to, on average, to, um, to contribute more than the Greenland ice sheet and also more than the Antarctic ice sheet, even though, of course, here before Greenland and Antarctica, the uncertainties are much larger. But just to emphasize, it's not only that now in the past they have contributed a lot, but even by the end of the century, there seem to be substantial contributors and for the mean even exceeding that of Antarctica and Greenland. But of course, I have to admit for Antarctica, it does not include these simulations, any collapse of the rest of the Arctic ice sheet or the, uh, these rapid changes. Um, we also looked here at the relative uncertainties. We wanted to know where where do the uncertainties in our projections come from? Is it the glacier model? Is it the climate models? Is it the RCP scenario or the internal variability? What you see here is in relative terms, in percent, um, these four contribut contributions over the century. And what you see is that the RCP scenarios are dominant by the end of the century. What is to be expected? And also the GCM uncertainties, if you add those two together, it's really the climate scenarios that is the largest uncertainty in our glacier modeling. The glacier model uncertainty is large in the beginning, but then um, becomes less as the climate model and RCP uh, scenario uncertainty becomes dominant. But there's large dif uh, regional differences. So I just want to wrap up. Here are projections, 17 to 38% volume mass loss reduction by the end of the century, a little bit less than what we projected before. Cumulative, cumulative sea level equivalent, 75 to 165 millimeters. The uncertainty or the scenario uncertainty, the RCP is really the largest source of uncertainty by the end of the century. But the glacier model uncertainty is a large source until the middle of the century. Um, Glacial MIP just entered his second phase. We've got another four years from Click to continue. And we want to do now not only for so far, we only looked at volume and area during, for the future. We also want to look at reconstructions, like how do the models perform in the past. We want to look at the components of mass change, not just the total volume change, but also like accumulation, ablation, and so on, to see, um, to understand a little bit more why these models differ in their projections. And we also want to quantify the committed future glacier mass loss. And just to mention here, this is the participants. So our group has grown over the years. We're very happy that more and more people in the world are actually doing these global simulations. And uh, the glacier myth is open to anybody who wants to contribute to it uh, with global, uh, global scale simulations. So I want to stop here. Thank you very much. And happy to take any questions if there are any. Wow. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you, Regina. Regina, that was fantastic. I think I learned something on every single slide. Uh, it was very helpful. Uh, we definitely have questions. Uh, uh, points of clarification. The first one I, I think is quite relevant from, from Twyla. Is the Marzion twenty twenty paper available yet? Uh, the paper is. It's going to come out any day. It's accepted. It's going to be online in a few days. 
Oh, OK, fantastic. OK, yeah, I definitely think uh, many of us will be downloading that too. Um, cool. Um, can, uh, I have a quick question, point of clarification. When, with regards to the uncertainty you mentioned in the glacier model, now is that with respect to whether or not the glacier, uh, the, the particular model included ice flow, or is that uh, more encompassing than that, like also, also the, the way mass balance is characterized? It's any of it. It's really, it's we take the ensemble where everything else is left constant, but only, okay. I mean, how many simulations do we have that have everything else the same, but the glacier model and look at the variance. So it includes any differences. And it includes okay. also the differences. I mean, many of the models, um, you cannot distangle, disentangle the, how they're downscaled the climate data. That's sometimes part of the glacier model. So it essentially includes everything what the model does, the model of physics and also the downscaling of the climate data. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the, uh, everyone, if you, uh, if you wanna ask a quick question, if you, you can go to the participant list and raise your hand, it should be the lower right of the um, uh, participant list box. And if you raise your hand, I can quickly MC any points of clarification for Regina. Oh, Tim's got a question. Uh, Regina, can you see Tim's question or I can, I can simply repeat it here? Uh, no, I didn't know how to do this. So, so Tim Bartholomew asks, is the glacier model uncertainty constant over time and its relative contribution is getting smaller? And then no. what are the major components of the glacier model uncertainty? So I guess you already covered the second one, but the first one. Uh, yes, I mean, this is here in relative terms. And yep. if you look in absolute terms, the uncertainties of every single component go up. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah, and that figure is also in the paper. Okay. Um, if, I, if I may add something there, um, this is Ben. Um, so for some regions and uh, RCP 8.5, the glacier model uncertainty actually is going down um, towards the end of the century because if all the glacier models agree that the glaciers are gone, um, then the uncertainty is smaller. But it's, it's really the exception. Uh, great. Uh, I, I do want to thank both you, uh, Regina and Ben, and the uh, Glacier Met Phase 2 participants. It's not easy to convey that much information that effectively, uh, particularly visually, that quickly. Uh, but every single figure you, you showed and how you explained it was really right on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, one last question from, oh, this is actually quite relevant, uh, from Wilbert. Is Glacier MIP officially endorsed by CMIP 6? And are there any plans to repeat the analyses for the SSP scenarios? And I, I would like to know what SSP scenarios are. That's the new RCPs. Oh, okay. Well, good to know. And yes, we are waiting. We initially had planned to do the second phase here with CMIP 6 uh, scenarios. Um, but because they were not available in time or not um, enough simulations, that's why we still did the RCPs. But the uh, ambition is definitely to use the new scenarios as they become available. Okay. Great. Uh, well, well, thank you, Regina. Um, I think uh, just to keep us moving and so we can sort of open it up more broadly afterwards, uh, we'll next, uh, if you could stop sharing your screen. Uh, and then, or Meredith can initiate that. Um, we can uh, uh, hand it over to Fabian and, uh, and Fabian can take it. All right, all right Fabian, he's a Zoom. you got the Zoom. All right, both of you got the Zoom. Well, right, I'm gonna mute myself. Go for it, Fabian. Can everybody, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, thanks, uh, Regina. It was a perfect introduction. So this is why we really wanted to have it this way that uh, she starts and then I go on. Um, my, my presentation is going to be um, somehow much more technical and much less uh, graphics as you are going to see. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the OGGM model, which has been around since a few years now and uh, online. And I want uh, especially today to convince you to join us on this uh, trip of making uh, of um, making OGGM even better than it is right now. 
Um, these slides are also available online. If you want to follow maybe as well, I'm going to just copy this as well in, this, in the chat if you want to follow them or if I'm going for some reason. Sorry, Fabian, to, yeah? uh, can I just I, I, I don't hear you very well. Okay, so Joe, I had to, I went ahead and um, stopped your video share because I think maybe you're having a bandwidth problem because you're becoming uh, gargled. And, but I think that he was just saying to be um, aware of the mic so that we can hear you clearly. Um, okay, um, can you still hear me now? Yes, we can hear you better now. Okay, I don't know what happened because I didn't do anything. I'll try to speak uh, even, even uh, louder. Um, okay, um, 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 I'm going to continue and see if it, uh, if it, uh, if it, uh, if it works. Um, so today I'm going to try to um, to OGM as not only a model, which is maybe most of the people know about so GGM is they think about it as a model, but also as a modeling framework. A model and ideas into. Um, so that the ecosystem around OGGM is growing and I'm going to focus especially on these tools that OGGM is providing to help your own uh, modeling work at the regional or global scale. Uh, for this, I'm going to showcase some of OGGM's features and especially the one that might be interesting for people who are not using OGGM alone, but maybe also have their own ideas they want to, uh, they, they want to tune in. And then if I have time, and I'd like to have the time for it a lot, I'd like also to talk about the bad sides of it, a little bit the challenges that we are facing right now with the project, um, which are very similar to other uh, open sources um, projects. Um, what I don't want to do today is that I'm not going to show you a lot of, uh, of uh, glaciers, actually. So this is one of the strange talk, uh, parts about this talk. There are not so many glaciers. And I also don't want that you come out of the talk with the impression that OGGM wants to be everything. Not at all what I mean by that. Uh, there are many, many very great models around uh, which are excellent, uh, are doing um, other things. Uh, sometimes you can even argue better than we do. And uh, especially model diversity is what drove uh, OGGM development in the first place. What we'd like to emphasize here is that we'd like uh, to be able to make uh, modeling comparison more intercomparison more meaningful, if you want. And I'll try to not get lost into the details. Uh, I'm not good at this point, so I try to be um, to be quick. And I'd like also to show that uh, that uh, the, the ideas I put forward here are maybe applicable to other issues as well. Um, so for the motivation behind the project, I'm going to go back um, to the problem of modeling glaciers globally, which is uh, made difficult mostly by the few data which is available. So we have an inventory now, but the quality of the data is bad. Even simple things like the DEMs are hard to get, and um, and it makes and it makes uncertainty assessment also very hard. And you've seen uh, this graph from Regina showing that uh, the uncertainty of, of glacier model was very high, um, starting, uh, so about 50% uh, at the beginning of the simulations. And what's interesting about this graph as well is what's not shown in the graph is that if you ask every single glacier model individually, they are all going to say that their uncertain uncertainty estimates are tiny, so tiny that most glacier models actually don't account for the model uncertainty in the future projections. They just account for the GCM uncertainty. So there is a mix, a mishmash here if you want something wrong going on, obviously, because this graph shows exactly the opposite. And the reason that that's so difficult to make uncertainty assessments here is that we need the tools for that. And we need to be certain about what 
um, what is driving these uncertainties. And even if Leigh Chamil did a very great job at uh, agreeing on certain protocols, like, okay, we are going to agree on the, on the, on the um, uh, 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 GCMs we are going to use, other things which are much harder to coordinate, for example, which DEM do you use, or do we agree on the way we don't scale the climate onto our glaciers? And this makes the comparison difficult. And this is why um, we uh, started the OGGM project as a way to isolate certain aspects of the modeling framework. Let's say you want to isolate the, the glacier mass balance model or you want to isolate the dynamical model. Is it possible to do so and to make more meaningful comparisons? And uh, it, finally, it's going to help us to, uh, to answer certain questions about, for, about uh, is it always better to add more physics to the model? Now, of, course, of course, there is a trend to always make the model more complex and OGGM is guilty of that as well. Uh, of making things more complex without asking the question, are we actually adding value? Are we adding uh, noise here? So this was our starting point. And then also one of the other reasons we made OGGM is that we wanted to be open source. And here, before I go on, I just want to make a very small, a small clarification because right now, most of the code we are doing is starting to become open because it has been, it is asked by our, uh, funding agencies or donors, but making code free, like freely available, is not what I mean by open source. What I mean by open source, I mean that free is one part of it, but other parts are equally um, important. Uh, in particular, the documentation, the ability to peer review what has been done, transparency, um, attribution, so that we are able to say, okay, this part of the code belongs to someone. And also we can attribute certain results to a modeling group, let's say. And I argue here that um, open source is capable of doing all these things very efficiently. Uh, I'm just going to illustrate here how uh, one of these processes works. So many, some of you already know and some maybe don't, but each change on the code base in one of the scientific ecosystem uh, software uh, is like a small review process if you want. You just want to make a change and people are going to argue about this change and then it's going to be merged into the, the code base. And this is even a step further than just sharing your code, is also allowing peer review at every stage of the scientific process. And uh, OGGM is no different than many other software, but uh, it's still using very modern tools to do these kind of things. And I'm not going to click on these links, but if you want to have a look at the tools we are using to try to make at least part of our code um, more sustainable, uh, please uh, have a look at this. Um, I'd like to spend much more time of it, uh, as you see, but uh, I'd like also to show a little bit how OGGM works so that you can maybe envision your own model within this workflow. So first of all, uh, OGGM is what we call a glacier-centric model. So we are modeling every single glacier, there are 200,000 worldwide, uh, individually. And this is what most glacier models are doing. Um, so here you are seeing an ice cap, and these are entities, and we are modeling each of these entities separately from another. Um, note that in the future, we could also model all of them together, but right now it's really each entity separately. And then we are going to go over a series of pre-processing steps. So we are generating a DM for these glaciers. Then we are computing geometric center lines, which we then assume to be flow lines. We compute their geometrical width and other uh, catchment uh, properties. And then we are inverting the eye thickness. So OGGM is one of the models that participated to the uh, Farinati 2019 estimates that was presented one month ago. And then we use a relatively old school but automatic uh, multiple flow line um, uh, model, so solving uh, shallow ice along the glaciers. And so one of the advantages that we have that many other models don't have is that we are also able to let our glacier grow, which is also a strength if you want to look at past uh, glacier evolution. So how does it look like in practice? Um, in practice, so in code now, it means that we have what we call glacier directories, which are the data containers containing all the data we need for this glacier, which is located on disk. And then we apply all these elements of the workflow in 
what we call tasks, which are just an action that we perform on these Glacier directories, if you want. And so the obvious advantage is that we can perform this task if we do every Glacier individually in parallel. And so this is uh, how the model works in the background. And then we have finally global tasks. So these are actions which are performed on all glaciers altogether. So one of the, one example is gathering all the data from each individual glaciers to share it with someone else as an example. Um, and this workflow has proven extremely uh, useful. And in code, it's also extremely slick is that you are going to initialize these glacier directories here, and then you are going to define the number of tasks you want to apply to your glaciers, and then you are just going to loop over them. And so my point here is going to say that we propose a certain workflow here, but we would be also very open for you to just say, we don't like the way you do this and this, and we'd like to tune in our own way to do it. And this is what I'd like to carry to you in this talk, is that if you want to do this in one of your projects, we'd like to, we will be here to help you to do that. So what do I mean when I mean extensible and modular? I mean that you are going to be able to tune in. Maybe it's not going to work perfectly like the picture in the background here. Maybe we are going to have to uh, iterate a little bit, but I would like to help you in this uh, process. Um, I like this analogy here with Legos because for me it was like programming was uh, always like playing with, with uh, Legos a little bit and building stuff. And I'd like to keep the analogy here. So the strategies we have in OGGM to be modular is that we use this persistence on disk like a database, if you want, is that every single glacier can be started from any point in the uh, flow line, in the workflow, if you want. And then the modularity starts when we say, okay, if we agree on a certain format for certain things, then another model could see the things differently. So Glogen, so the model by Matthias Hus and Regina Hoff, could also fit in this framework easily because on disk they would be the same thing, just the way we compute the flow lines is a little bit different. Another strategy we use is that we use what we call separation of concerns, is that we really separate the uh, evolution model from the mass balance model. And one a very strong uh, step forward we did in the last couple of months is that I had David Rons from the University of Dallas by Fairbanks in Innsbruck and we worked together to make his very fancy mass balance model with Bayesian statistics and everything actually able to use the OGGM dynamical model in the background. So if you don't like our model, which many people don't, for, uh, for reasons I don't want to mention here, then you can still use another mass balance model with, uh, with OGGM dynamical model. Um, and last but not least, we are very clear about that, that we don't want your code to be part of the OGGM code base. And we made uh, an example repository to do that. Like, thanks to the, um, to the way Python works, we really don't, you don't need to share your code with us and you have full control, which is very important for attribution. If you want the paper to be cited and the funding agency to continue to finance your work, you actually want to be in control of your code. And this is possible. You can uh, participate in the OGGM development or let's say your own module into OGGM while still having your own branding and you don't even have to call it OGGM if you don't want to. So just have a look at this uh, repository if you want to, uh, to jump in. And uh, other things we'd like to do also to uh, facilitate uh, this modularity because Let's be honest, it's never going to be uh, like, uh, like that. Uh, we'd like to help you in this process and we document the project and we'll help you if you want to, uh, let's say, make your own mass balance model work with OGGM. And the last thing I've been working on, uh, taking advantage of the quarantine now, is what we are going to call OGGM Shop. It's not out right now, but I hope it to be out um, soon, where we want the users to do like a shopping list and say, we'd like to grab this data and this data for this many glacier. Uh, examples being topography or climate data and so on and so forth. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples. One of them is, um, has been shared on Cryolist recently. Um, it's um, the RGI topo data set, <coughs> sorry, which, um, which um, is a bunch of the DMs you can download for your glacier. Another project I'm working on right now is to add in a glacier velocity to each single glacier, so from the each life data set. And so my vision is to have a very simple code which does this, like we import from the shop and we just add the data to our glaciers. 
I would like to encourage you to have a look at our uh, online uh, tutorials, which are based on, on uh, Docker containers and very fancy things, um, um, which you can try online if you have some time, but don't want to install OGGM, for example, you can go to our tutorials and have a look at them. Um, I'm already a little bit late, but I'm just going to spend one minute to open the discussions about the challenges we are facing. Um, one of them is that um, the model is quite old already now and that we have a technical debt. It's called, is that nothing is ever perfect and the, and the code is getting grow, is growing and is not so nice. And this is actually an obstacle to uh, modularity. And then another thing I noticed with time as well is that the entry level for new contribution is quite high. Uh, you've heard me, I've talked about certain tools which are new to many. And um, I, I see a little bit of the need for training and it's not easy to, let's say, do a PhD at the same time as contributing to the model. And I think the model is suffering a little bit from this, that we have a basically um, a funding uh, issues, that some imp improvements to the model, like simple ones, uh, which are called incremental, uh, require time, uh, but we don't have easily money to do so. So we are trying to do to search fundings and we are trying always to motivate the funding agencies to put more money into software, but it's not always uh, easy. Um, I'll leave you uh, there um, with the last message is that OGGM is a framework and that we encourage cherry picking and, um, and we would love to hear back from you if you want to use the model or join the, this, uh, this effort with us. Uh, that's all from my side. I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Awesome. Thank you, Fabian. Can you hear me okay now? Yes. Okay. Apologize for the, uh, my bandwidth issues earlier. Uh, that was really great. Uh, very uh, honest and thought-provoking uh, talk. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I'm going to open up the floor to questions. And, and you can also raise your hand if you'd like to pose your question audio. I've certainly got a couple, but I'll just give people a couple seconds to raise their hands or put them in the chat. All right. All right, I'll, I'll start off with a question for you, Fabian. Um, I, I love the concept of the OGGM shop and um, the, the, the way you make it modular so that people can take their own ideas. And one example, uh, that occurred to me was uh, you showed uh, it's live and and say it should be possible at some point to have within OGM GGM the velocities uh, for a given glacier from it's live mm -hmm. and you also talked about flow lines that you currently compute geometrically so would one example of a, a sort of mo uh, independent module that someone could develop is is having flow lines that are it's live constrained. I realize the azimuths for the velocities are not always ideal, um, or maybe somehow reconciling geometric flow lines with observed flow lines. Totally. Uh, this uh, this uh, would make a lot of sense. Uh, always pending that the, the the quality of the data allows to do this on a very large scale, but this would be an, a very great way to do it. And again, uh, this is a very good example because there is no reason why these flow lines, which are computed on velocities, are not compatible mm -hmm. with the rest of the model afterwards. Um, so this would be a oh, exactly. example yeah. of changing something at the beginning of the chain. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you made that very clear that uh, if you uh, if you choose a different source for one element, that doesn't mean you have to completely change how you address the other elements. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any other questions for Fabian? Oh, we got a big one from Twyla. Fabian, can you see that? Yeah, On, I think it's from the group chat. Oh, for Regina. Oh, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Oh, okay, that's fine. And we can open the discussion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, any other quick questions for Fabian, though? Oh, here we go. One from uh, Liz LT. Can you see that? So yes, so Liz is asking if we um, if we could do um, multimodal ensemble uh, simulations using a range of different models. Um, so this would be the vision, um, but for that we definitely more people joining the train. So what I do, and in my this is one of these type of incremental uh, improvements I'm trying to make is that I am going to the other models in the literature 
like the one by Matthias Hus as an example, where he has a very funny way to see glaciers. They are not geometrical anymore, but he beams them together. And mm -hmm. I've seen since a long time that it's possible to use this way of computing flow line glaciers as well, very easily within the OGGM framework. Um, so this would be a very good example of something that I can do, but then the rest is going to depend on on other people jumping in this train, basically, because we are not able to do everything um, at all, uh, alone. But this would be the idea to have different modules to do things and then really address the important questions. Uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, um, are we adding noise? Are, are we adding value if we say switch on dynamics, for example, ice dynamics, or if we switch on um, uh, energy balance modeling? or these kind of things. And uh, my point is to, we can still do that the way we do it without a GGM, but a GGM would facilitate to isolate certain aspects. I'm, I'm thinking, Fabian, of an example, say if you wanted to lower the bar, if um, say you were interested in the effect of debris cover upon glacier mass balance and flow, you could focus perhaps initially on just regions where that's more prominent, say the Alaska or the Himalayas, uh, before you had to try to scale it up to all of the glaciers. Is that, yeah. is that a reasonable way of thinking about it? I mean, this is how we do it uh, in OGGM, but I've seen also that it's a, it's a, uh, so it's slowing down certain, I, I like to have a look at every single glaciers like I showed you, I showed you Columbia, um, because it's possible basically, since every glacier is simulated independently, but um, I've seen also that it's useful sometimes to think big from the scratch. Uh, that being said, uh, it's possible to just pick one glacier with OGGM and do the shopping on this glacier and uh, make it run. Uh, if you do that, you just have to be aware that because of all the uncertainties, the results might look bad for this one glacier, basically. But uh, yes, working at the regional scale or even basin scale is not an issue. Yeah. So I see we have a question from, thank you. Uh, I see we have a question from Jordi Bolivar, and we'll get to that and then come back to Twyla's question. Uh, yeah. I, so I'm going to read it. So um, will yeah. it be possible to keep the whole framework to manage glacier data and force things and plug both a new mass balance and glacier dynamics model? So if you want to change both things, um, I think it's possible. And then you are just using the OGGM preprocessing, which uh, is more following this uh, shop ID. Um, what would be nice if we agree on uh, maybe what is a glacier evolution model, for example, on the output of, of this, but uh, you can jump in at any step in the processing chain. So if you jump in uh, before the mass balance is computed and before the dynamics is computed, feel free to do so and download the data. Uh, it's available already. Actually, all these preprocessed steps are available for download, uh, to download from everyone. So this will be also a way to at least uh, lower the, ent the entry level and say, uh, we at least agree on the DMs we are using on the climate data. So thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you, Fabian. Uh, I see Forrest has a question, uh, and oh, and then Regina's already answered Twyla's question, but we'll we'll come back to that very shortly after one more from Forrest. Okay, yeah, um, thank you. Uh, that was awesome. Um, I definitely want to jump on the OGGM train, uh, so I'm hoping to be able to attend the uh, April fifteenth meeting. Um, so I'll have a lot more questions then. Um, but uh, just generally speaking. Um, I'm interested in applying the OGGM um, in like the tropical Andes. And there's a lot of strange things going on there, complex topography, uh, debris cover, no real like station data at high altitudes, um, many factors involved. Um, but, you know, aside from that, um, one of the things that we're interested in doing at the Bird Center is, is using the OGGM modeling environment uh, for uh, paleo evolutionary modeling. Yeah. And I saw the, the paper by ICE and colleagues, um, and that was, that was pretty informative. Um, but I was wondering if there's been um, any progress made in, in that regard. I guess I have some ideas, but I uh, figured I'd ask, ask you. Yeah, thanks for the question. So it's, I think it's calling many points and I'd be happy to discuss them with you uh, in, in more detail. Um, so paleo, it depends. So I think that OGGM is one of the few large scale model which is able to let the glacier grow and have a geometry like we've seen. Uh, that being said is that asking questions like uh, glacial times 
uh, there the question remains is the flow line assumption we are using and this glacier centric approach the right one to simulate glaciers which were by order of magnitude larger than they are today so we are working uh, and i mean we in the university of innsbruck uh, we are working on doing post uh, little ice age simulations for example where we still believe it's okay to use the assumptions we use right now for really really large glaciers i think it depends really on the use case and i would be happy to discuss this in more detail mm -hmm. Also, like tropical Andes, I think it's very difficult from the mass balance. So I think this is where you would definitely need something different than what we are doing uh, with the degree day model and this kind of things. We can we can argue on the details afterwards. Awesome, thanks, Fabian. Uh, so Regina addressed um, Twyla's question uh, regarding the. Uh, the the horrible competition between Greenland <laughs> and uh, global glaciers. And uh, yeah, Regina, do you want to add anything uh, on that for uh, the 21st century? Yeah, I, I mean, as I wrote, I mean, it might have been a little confusing, but it's the, the rates at the moment, Greenland is a little bit higher than the glacier rate of sea level rise. What I mentioned is just this figure from the SRO IPC report that when they integrated over the entire century, but that by the end of the century, cumulative, um, the projection at the moment, what is available, show that the glaciers are still higher on average than Greenland. Um, but of course, Greenland has huge uncertainties, and there might not be. I mean, we have done all this effort to to make these projections with the glaciers, and the uncertainties for the glaciers are much less than for the ice sheets. So it depends, of course. Um, yeah, with better projections for Greenland, this might change. So do you do you work walk over to Andy Schwanden's office who bottles Greenland and you're like you're more uncertain and he says no you're more uncertain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we work together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, yeah. So so um, yeah. so while um, you know uh, while we're on the topic of what uh, Bobby mentioned in, in terms of open release. Um, uh, you, uh, the, what you meant for Glacier Met Phase Two, that's going to be published in the AGU Journal, and I assume there'll be some sort of uh, product release associated with the Glacier Met outputs that'll be available to all. Uh, how how is that going to work? Um, I'm going to share again. because the, the the data is already there, so I'm going to share oh. the chat. Ben, if you allow me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I actually I, I added the link to the data um, into the chat. Oh, you guys are way ahead of us. Okay, great. Well, uh, there goes my question. Uh, uh, any other uh, folk have broader questions uh, for the for both Regina and Fabian? Uh, it really is wonderful, by the way, to just see these connections, uh, it, the way it works, and the fact that uh, there really are good efforts to get uh, global answers to these questions. May I have a uh, maybe a naive question? Uh, so for the glacier glacier models for future scenarios, uh, it, it, they take the atmospheric input. Are they getting from the GCMs or specified? In these global simulations, are uh, we take GCM data? They take the same GCM uh, data. I mean, that was now in the second phase where we had, we picked 10 GCMs and required or wanted all the modeling groups to use these 10 GCMs. Okay, all right, thank you very much. And most of the models just use temperature, new surface temperature and precipitation. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yeah, Liz has a question, uh, Regina, which is, is a good one. I had this, a similar one. Uh, what is the one Earth system model that you mentioned that in, was involved with Glacier Met? Uh, it's from Britain. Maybe Ben, you know, <laughs> you remember it better. <laughs> Jules. Yeah, I, was, I oh. was afraid, yeah, it's called Jules. Um, so it's, uh, there, there's a paper by Sarah Shannon um, in the cryosphere that describes that model. Okay. It's, uh, it's so an do you, interesting uh, do you, uh, Recommend it? Is it one that uh, you know more glaciologists should be exploring as uh, potentially forging connections with uh, with their their favorite uh, ice mass down the road? Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's a tough question to answer. <laughs> um, yeah. 
I, I mean, it's, it's very different from the rest of the models. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I definitely see lots of value um, in having a very different approach from the rest of the models. So it's really adding lots of diversity. Um, I would say it's not really clear which of the models is the best in any sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, think, yeah. I think I hear some variation of that last statement in almost every modeling talk. <laughs> I mean, that's why I think the, the, the next step is so important that we not just look at the um, sort of integrated outcome of the volume and area changes, but really look at the components of mass change. And that will re reveal more if some models are unrealistic. If you really Absolutely. model it, look at the accumulation chair and, and the melt uh, rates, because then we can constrain it a lot more and see which models may, may not be the greatest. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, there, there are um, some ice sheet models uh, compare that for mass balance, uh, it, it compare that against elevation, observed elevation change for certain sectors. Um, I know Isabel Nias has done that for the Amundsen Sea. Uh, I don't know how commonly that's applied elsewhere yet, though. That actually prompts a general question that I had for both Reen and Fabian. Um, if you had to make a call on what observational data are most necessary for making improvements in these global glacier modeling efforts. Um, what would they be and how would they be incorporated? So, you know, DHDT information or, um, you know, surface measurements, field measurements of glacier mass balance or um, initial glacier volume to constrain the boundary condition. I see everybody smiling. Obviously, we have a wish list for what we could constrain, but if you um, if you had to pick one, what is the most um, pressing or critical? Um, I would say it's really the uncertainty of the precipitation is large. And to constrain that, because you can get, you can get the final result right if you overestimate a precipitation, and overestimate melt. And the model, because we have these, two, we tweak these parameters, you can get it right. So I think the key is really going to the components and there's like precipitation is a key one, especially in this um, high complex topography where the GCMs are doing a bad job and also RCMs are doing a bad job. So we need to constrain the precipitation. But maybe Ben has a different opinion. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to agree. Ben, please go ahead, Ben. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't have a different opinion without thinking about it, so. I, I'm, I'm not going to also, uh, because of the, all the wish list, I think every single point is important. So all, all the data you mentioned, all is important, but I'm just going to finish with an anecdote a little bit, which shows a little bit what we have to fight with. Uh, at the very basic level is that uh, people and researchers are, today are working very hard on providing DHDT maps all over the globe. So papers are going out now with global assessments and regional assessments of DHDT of a decade and this kind of thing. So very high level of data processing and, um, and the statistical handling, data handling. But we have to fight with even much simpler problem is that we don't have a single DM for each glacier alone. So this, has, uh, this was the state until a couple of months ago. Uh, we didn't have a single DM for each glacier. And now that we have a DM for each glacier, there is a big disagreement between the time of the outline provided by the AGI and the DEM itself. Sometimes we have 10, 20 years. So we are talking about very basic, very basic issues here. Even before we start uh, going into the details of uh, precipitation or, or DHDT or sickness or these kind of things. That's a, that's a great Fabia, uh, point, Fabian. I, I do want to start to wrap up, but given what you just mentioned, are you familiar with the Earth DEM effort that is ongoing that will address that to some degree? Yes. Uh, so we, uh, if you if you have any input, you could take. Give please visit us on uh, this RGI Topo website. So I've linked it as well in my presentation, and on uh, on Cryolis where the input from people has been super valuable because we have been pointed to new products, etc. I'm not sure it's going oh. to solve the problem of the discrepancy between the outline dates and the DM dates, um, but at least uh, right now we are on a very good track to solve this DM problem. At least. Yeah. Thanks for the input. Oh. Okay, cool. Well, thank you, Fabian. And uh, thank you again, uh, uh, both of you um, uh, for presenting. It was really fantastic. And I hope everyone uh, gained a good amount of information out of it. Um, uh, we, uh, so I, I forgot to mention the title of the seminar at the beginning, which was modeling all of the glaciers. 
uh, which is it's really awesome that we could even consider that as uh, as a title for a seminar at, at this point in our our study of glaciology. Uh, and next, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about what's going to happen on the sea level rise side of things on May 14th at the same time. Uh, and the title of that seminar is going to be Rising Oceans Guaranteed. And you might be thinking, hey, wait, I've read a paper called that. And yes, uh, Twyla wrote one, which is excellent. And the title was so good uh, that we're stealing it with her permission. And uh, we'll be hearing from Twyla Moon uh, from NSIDC and Michael Zemp from the uh, World Glacier Monitoring Service, uh, who will be discussing uh, global, uh, glacier mass balance and uh, Arctic mass balance, uh, respectively. So uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining. And uh, we hope to see you again uh, in a little over a month uh, online. And uh, yeah, thanks. Great, great talks. Really appreciate it. Great discussion, too. Caitlin, do you want to add anything to that? Nope, I've just been making little comments in the chat, but thanks everybody for gathering in this space and uh, and keep up the good work. It's just so encouraging and um, inspiring to get together in this way. So thanks again to Regina and Fabian for really excellent presentations. I have a whole list of questions that um, hopefully will get asked or at least keep me busy and motivated. Um, and yeah, everybody stay safe and uh, tune back in in May if you're uh, interested and available. So take care and, and thanks Joe so much for uh, coordinating. Cheers. No yeah, cheers. Go, go team. Thank you, everyone. And uh, have a great rest of your day, however long it lasts. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.